Welcome to the podcast of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine for August 12th. We're here in Western Pennsylvania, a group of journalists and wellness professionals, doctors, nurses, all kinds of groovy people. And we talk about integrative medicine, lifestyle medicine, good choices that you can make to be a healthier person. And uh, we are on the web and also in print. So our summer issue is out there right now. If you are interested in being in the fall issue, that's closing out next week. Uh, so if you are interested in being that, give me a call or an email at svenhosford at gmail. We record here every Tuesday at 4 o'clock right here in the Sorgatron Media Studios. And you can find us on Facebook, Google+, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, and Stitcher. So coming up in future podcasts, next week, we've got Joni Sturgill. And she'll be here talking about mindful meditation and some of the research that's now saying that these ancient practices are a really good thing for your mental health. A uh, big surprise for those of us who practice them. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to have David Lasondak, a friend of mine who is a structural integration expert. I want to say he's an expert. Probably knows more about fascia than anybody you know, and a uh, real smart guy to listen to about things uh, which it's going to blow your mind, the stuff he's going to tell you. And we just got the confirmation three weeks from now, we're going to have Steve Behrman, also known as Swami Beyondananda. Yes, the Swami is returning. He'll be in Canton, Ohio in uh, September. We'll talk about that in the calendar. And he'll be here in three weeks uh, to spread his un unusually cheerful good cheer. So uh, coming up in this podcast, uh, I'm so excited about this. Uh, Chef AJ, uh, she's the author of the book Unprocessed, How to Achieve Vibrant Health and Your Ideal Weight. And the book promises that whether you want to lower your cholesterol, prevent or reverse many common lifestyle diseases, lose weight, or just look and feel great, Chef AJ can show you how to incorporate more fresh fruits, vegetables in your diet in ways that are easy delicious and fun. Now, I met her a couple weeks ago, or last month, it was at the uh, Schwartz Market. And let me tell you, she made some food that just knocked my socks off. I haven't been able to find my socks in a month. Uh, really good, really delicious, really healthy. And the key thing is no oil, no salt, no sugar. We're going to find out how she does that and still has great taste. So she is a chef, first off. But first, let's get a look at our calendar for the week. A lot going on this weekend. Uh, Friday is another acupuncture happy hour with our friend Debbie Harden. Be sure and go back and watch her podcast on acupuncture if you haven't seen it. She does these wonderful little Friday de-stress routines. It'll be at the Newman Center Friday, 6.30 to 8.30. Just $25, and it's the best de-stressing exercise you'll probably get all week. Uh, this weekend, really busy weekend, on the 16th, on Saturday, uh, we're going to have the wellness meet and greet from Organically Social. Trenton is going to be there with all 50 now, 50 plus uh, members are, of his uh, network, health and wellness deals. I'll be there with a wellness oasis. Now, this is going to be a place where you can come in, relax, research, ask questions, find answers. I'm going to connect people with professionals. Uh, we're also going to have a meeting of our integrative medicine professionals there at 11 a.m. at the Pittsburgh Public Market. So come on down to the Strip District Saturday morning. 9 to 1 is the wellness meet and greet. Uh, and 11 o'clock is going to be our integrative medicine professionals meetup. Also that same day, Saturday, is the Sorgles Farms Farm to Fork Dinner chance for you to uh, have a really fun sunset dinner out in the farm at Sorgles Market. Uh, also that same evening, Greta Polo, our favorite dance uh, movement specialist, is going to be doing another one of her dance energetics. This is an experiential journey through the chakras, allowing you to play and embody all seven ways of being in your body and in the world. She uses movement, energy to heal the mind, body, and spirit. It's a therapeutic movement class. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. A lot of fun, and it's all happening Saturday night, 6.30 to 7.30 for Early Reg. Uh, BYS Yoga on the south side, $12 in advance, 15 at the door. Be sure to go to gretapolo.com to find out more about that. There's a very special event coming up on the 25th, and I recently talked to Jeffrey Cohen, the executive director of the Jewish Vegetarians of North America, about it. Let's hear what he has to say. So I'm uh, on, the, on the hangout today with Jeffrey Cohen, who is the executive director of the Jewish Vegetarians of North America, and he's going to be talking about a very special event coming up real soon. Great to have you with us, Jeffrey. Great to be with you, man. 
So first of all, tell us a little bit about your organization, the Jewish Vegetarians of North America. Sure, Jewish Vegetarians of North America, we're obviously an international organization that um, we're a veg advocacy organization that does outreach to the Jewish community in the United States and Canada. And the reason our organization exists is basically twofold. The first is that while there's many organizations, as you know, Sven, doing fantastic work in the area of veg advocacy, they do not have access to synagogues and Jewish community centers and Jewish student centers and Jewish media and on and on. We do. So we get that message before Jewish audiences, all these different ways. And secondly, what's interesting is that the Bible, or what we call the Torah, really places an emphasis on plant-based diets and really frowns upon eating meat. So well, we're on a yeah, very solid theological foundation. I want to get into that a little bit more. Just um, talk a little bit more about why plant-based diet is a Jewish tradition. I really find this fascinating. Yeah, well, it starts with Genesis 1.29, the very first chapter of the Bible, where the first time God is recorded as talking to human beings, he says, or I don't think God has a gender, but God says, you will eat the plants and only the plants, essentially. Genesis 1.29. Okay. So there's no dispute among rabbis or any ministers or theologians of any stripe that the first dietary instructions to human beings were to eat a plant-based diet. That's amazing. So, it, and it's, you say it goes throughout the entire Torah. Yes, there is no, we never say and we cannot say that meat eating is prohibited in the Bible because it is permitted, but in the places where meat eating is discussed, it is done so in a negative context. So it is made quite clear that it is not God's preference, but it is a concession to human beings' baser instincts. How is the reception when you go to synagogues and temples? You know, it's interesting because um, while there is definitely a disproportionate number of rabbis who are vegetarian or vegans for some of the reasons we've just talked about, um, usually people in the synagogues have not heard this message and have not seen the dots connected in the Torah the way they should be connected. So quite often they're surprised and they're almost angry that their rabbis and educators never taught them this. Because when we show them the text right from the Torah, it's undeniable. And we do not cherry pick and only talk about the verses that support a plant-based diet. We show them the texts that talk about eating meat and how we should treat the animals, and they actually reinforce our message. Well, that uh, how to treat animals is really the, the subject of our what we want to talk about here. We've got a really amazing event coming up. Um, it, the whole issue of comparing the Holocaust to factory farming, this must be, must be a very touchy issue, and it, it must be very easy to offend uh, anybody on any side of this, this argument. So talk about, uh, talk about the event and, and your guest. Yeah, great points, man, because as an organization, we do not invoke analogies to the Holocaust. Between factory farming and the Holocaust as a general rule, in fact, I have spoken publicly many times cautioning veg advocates not to do that because it just creates a distraction and prevents your message from being heard. However, Alex Hershaft, who is one of the very top national leaders of the animal rights movement, is himself a Holocaust survivor from the Warsaw Ghetto. And the fact is, his experience as a child in the Warsaw Ghetto and the oppression and the suffering he endured is what motivated him to become a champion of farmed animals. So Alex Hershaft, unlike you or me, can authentically draw comparisons and analogies between the Holocaust and factory farming. That's... Um... I don't know his whole story, but that's just so compelling, uh, so uh, amazing of a story. How uh, can you talk a little bit about his journey from after the war and how he got into the animal rights? Um, well, he can definitely do a better job of that than I can, and that's what he's going to be talking about on August 25th. Okay. But, um, he, after the war, he uh, lived in Israel for a time. He 
uh, that's where I actually became vegetarian and ultimately vegan. And he um, actually obtained a PhD in chemistry on a very promising degree, um, career in the field of chemistry ahead of him. And he threw that all, of, all away to devote his life to farmed animal advocacy. And he created the first national organization devoted to farm animals, which is the organization with the acronym FARM. This was in the early 1980s, before PETA, before the Humane Society was doing anything about farmed animals. Alex was a true visionary, and he's created an organization which has now become a major player in the animal rights field. Well, this is really, uh, I think it's going to be an amazing evening. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, give us a little more details about where and when and how much. Yeah, thanks. It's going to be at Rodef Shalom. And what's, what makes this event truly historic, and it's really amazing that's happening in Pittsburgh and not in New York or Los Angeles, is that there has never been an officially accredited Holocaust organization that has been involved in a program about veganism and farmed animals. But in this case, the Holocaust Center of Greater Pittsburgh is a co-sponsor of the program, as is Rodef Shalom, which is the largest Jewish congregation in Pittsburgh. And in fact, the event will be at Rodef Shalom, 4905 Fifth Avenue. There will be a reception at 6 o'clock with vegan hors d'oeuvres, where people will have a chance to meet Alex in a more intimate setting. And then the lecture will be at 7. Um, tickets for both are available online at Jewish. Just go to JewishVeg.com. Um, you'll see the event prominently displayed on our homepage. So that's JewishVeg.com. And advanced tickets are available at a five-dollar discount. We kept the ticket price very low because we want to get as allow as many people as possible to participate in this historic event. So he, there's never been this kind of. Uh, of an event before anywhere is what you're saying. Well, in fact, what's interesting, um, Alex has never really delivered a lecture like this himself. So not only has no Holocaust organization ever participated in an event like this, Alex himself has never delivered a lecture like this. So it's truly historic on those two different levels. Wow. And we're hoping that and counting on this event being a huge success so that we can replicate it in communities across the country. Uh, it's amazing, amazing. Uh, I really congratulate you for putting this all together, and my heart goes out to your your whole organization and Alex and everything that uh, that he's fighting for. It's just it's a wonderful cause. Yeah, and Alex, as people will see, is a fantastic public speaker. He's very disarming, very charming, and uh, what's what makes him such an effective vegan advocate. Well, great. Well, Jeffrey Cohen, Executive Director of the North, uh, uh, the Jewish Vegetarians of North America, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Sven. I look forward to seeing you on the 25th. So we're really looking forward to that. So we'll see you on the 25th. And also in the calendar this week on September 9th is the Body Love Tour. Our friend Lindsay Smith will be at the Union Project. Uh, that's, uh, I believe, 6 to 9 p.m., uh, really good way to be inspired and learn to love your body. Uh, there is a, a friend of mine named Beth Caldwell on a, September 11th. She's going to be a part of a uh, an event. I'm going to get some more details on it, but let me tell you, this is a gal you want to connect up with if you really want to learn your marketing. Beth Caldwell, Pittsburgh Professional Women. We'll get you some more details about that, but she's a part of Steve Harvey's new uh, inspirational, motivational university. Uh, also on September 12th is uh, Patty Lemmer's vaccination conversation at Phipps Conservatory. If you haven't, be sure to go back and watch that podcast with her that we did. It's absolutely mind-blowing. And this is a chance for very calm and sedate and knowledgeable people to have a, uh, a safe conversation about vaccinations. Uh, be sure to go to Eventbrite and search for Pittsburgh vaccinations if you want details about that. We also have another event coming up on the 13th. I'm going to get more information for you. It's going to be a uh, uh, big uh, wellness event at uh, RMU, uh, Robert Morris University. Uh, that'll be coming up in our next podcast as well. Uh, this was a real fun one. September 25th, Dr. Ramirez is going to be hosting a leader in Tai Chi for good health. Uh, Australian family physician Paul Lamb began practicing Tai Chi as a way to improve his uh, 
to improve his own arthritis, and he has since become a world leader in the field of Tai Chi. He's going to be here in Pittsburgh at the Bethel Park Community Center, September 25th at 7 p.m., uh, and that's uh, located in Bethel Park, of course, uh, 5151 Park Avenue. Jose Ramirez del Toro is going to be hosting. He is the ortho, uh, of the orthopedic group, and he is the director uh I'm sorry, Dr. Lamb is the director of the Tai Chi for Health Institute. So we're going to get one or the other of those two on our podcast here very soon. Uh, you can email mcgeek, mcgeek, at einetwork.net or 412-835-9360, extension 264, uh, to find out more about that. We'll have more information in our future calendars also. And then, as we said, September 27th, be sure to uh, get in your car and drive on out to Canton, Ohio, uh, where a place called Merging Hearts is hosting Swami Biyandananda um, on a Saturday evening. There'll be a fun little event. And then a Sunday, uh, he'll be doing a play shop because, you know, you're not going to work with the Swami. It's going to be a play shop with him and his wife, Trudy, called Involuntary Simplicity. And I'm sure it's going to be fun. And I'm really looking forward to having him on our podcast in three weeks. Uh, in November, make sure you've marked your calendar now for November 2nd through the 4th, the Pittsburgh School of Massage Fall Conference for Massage CEs at Seven Springs Resort. Be sure to go to pghschmass.com for more information about that. Also in uh, November is Dan Wagner's trip to Ecuador. Uh, it's part of the Student Rainforest Fund, but it's open to everyone. A really good opportunity for health professionals, wellness professionals to learn from Dan. Also, Dr. Chaudhry is going to be going, and also Ola Obasi. And if you don't know those names, you got to go back and watch our podcast. So all those people will be on the trip. Studentrainforestfund.org is where you want to go for that. And remember, November is going to be Juice Fest month. More details coming on that. That's the calendar for this week. Now let's get to our guest. Chef AJ has followed a plant-based diet for over 36 years. She is a chef, culinary instructor, professional speaker, and author. She's the author of the popular book, Unprocessed, How to Achieve Vibrant Health and Your Ideal Weight. Uh, the book is half confessional memoir, half delectable recipes, and it chronicles her journey from a junk food vegan faced mm -hmm. with a diagnosis of precancerous polyps to learning how to establish uh, a healthy body through food. Many of her recipes you can find on her YouTube cooking show, The Chef and the Dietitian. She holds a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University and is a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Welcome, Chef AJ. Hi, thank you. First of all, your website says that you were a comedian in a past life. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, a long time ago. You were actually on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I really was. With, I was on many times. I was first time I was on with Joey Bishop. You have to be pretty old to remember him. <laughs> you do not look and, old enough to be on the show with I, Joey Bishop. You know, I, I'm, I'm 54 and a half, so oh you know, that's, what, that's what eating healthy food will do. But yes, I was on with Joey Bishop. And then I was on with Johnny Carson, and then I was on with Jay Leno. Oh, my goodness. So it, and yes. you've been on Letterman? So you have to start with a joke. I actually have been on Letterman, too. So that yeah. was many, many years ago, but it was it was wonderful. Well, let's start off with a joke here. You, you were a comedian. Let's give, give us something to get started with. Okay, a, a joke. Well, um, uh, I'm Jewish, so I can tell you this joke. Okay. What does a Jewish baby girl say the minute she's born, right after coming out of the birth canal? I don't know. So you're a doctor? <laughs> So okay. that's my favorite joke. That's your favorite joke. Oh, great. My favorite joke because it's so true. So true. Well, we I, we met uh, a month ago here at the Schwartzmark in Pittsburgh, and I was so impressed that not only you have lots of good information, but you're able to mm -hmm. deliver it with a spoonful of sugar, or in your case, actually a spoonful dates. of something other than sugar. sugar a right. spoonful of, of whole dates, right? Whole no dates. <laughs> so the first thing we want to explode is this whole idea that healthy food has to have no taste. You were a chef before you became mm -hmm. a healthy person. Uh, so, Absolutely. You know, that, I, I was a restaurant chef. I was an executive pastry chef at a restaurant that wasn't even vegan or plant-based, but I still was able to make delicious desserts without sugar, oil, salt, and mostly even flour. Yeah, there's a misconception that healthy food doesn't taste good. It's not just celery. I mean, especially right. nowadays, it's it, it's it's amazing. I mean, these plant-based chefs can make anything look and taste just, just like what you're used to eating. Now, is that that's the good use of substitutes or let's talk about also how as you 
as you start eating healthier and as you eat less meat and the things that kind of bludgeon your taste buds, mm -hmm. your, 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 your uh, taste buds actually expand and you get more right. of an appreciation of the subtler varieties of things in the middle of the spectrum. I think, I think as you start eating healthier, healthier food tastes good. You know, people think that, oh, it's so boring or limited to eat a plant-based diet. But when you think about what the standard American diet is or people that eat animal products, how many animals do they really eat? Maybe a cow, a pig, a chicken maybe a lamb, maybe a fish. So they maybe eat maybe four or five animals. But in the plant kingdom, there's thousands of varieties. I mean, just in legume category alone, beans and lentils and split peas, there's like 18,000 choices. So the varieties are really endless. So it's not bland. It's not boring. It's just doesn't have animal products in it. And I think a real important part of your story, and you want to give us a little background too, is how for many years you were a vegetarian for ethical reasons, Mm -hmm. But you were and a great, and, and I still am. I right. still am. However, my health suffered because when I went vegan in 1977 for ethical reasons, I actually was living in Pennsylvania, attending the University of Pennsylvania. I didn't know anything about health. There wasn't internet to help me or Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine to guide me to healthy choices. So basically, I just ate junk food, sugar, flour, oil, salt, processed food, candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream all day long. Soda is vegan, but there were no <laughs> nutrients in it. I wasn't eating. I was the only vegetarian vegetarian so that didn't eat any fruits and vegetables, you know? Yeah. Skittles were my, my fruit. I ate Skittles, you know, <laughs> my my rainbow of fruit for the day. You get all your colors right there at one handful. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, I did eat the rainbow, but not the right rainbow. Well, so you had your own health crisis and then you, you learned mm -hmm. the right way to eat. You've written this book. Right. It's very popular. You've got great endorsements. My goodness. T. Colin Campbell, Thank Rip Esselstein, yeah. Joel Furman, many, many others. How, where did you learn your training? How did you get your training? What, what training did you get? Well, my chef training I got at the Living Light Culinary Arts Institute in 2003, but I, I've pretty much read everything ever written on plant-based nutrition. I mean, not everything, obviously, but all the big books that you can imagine by all the, the people you mentioned, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Furman, Dr. Campbell. And I don't just read them. I read them over and over and over. And I've taken the Cornell course in plant-based nutrition as well. So that's where I got that learning because, you know, your doctors don't really get nutritional training in medical school. They get very little, if any. And so- right. If you want to learn this, you can't really go to a conventional medical doctor because they've never learned this. And so I go to the doctors that do know this and I learn from them and I learn from their teachings. And anytime there's a health seminar anywhere, I go to it. American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I'm a member of, and they're always having conferences. So I'm always learning. And every day I'm on Medscape or PubMed and reading whatever I can about this. So I, I love learning about this so that I can teach other people this as well. And so, you know, the health thing is great. But the food, if it tastes terrible, people aren't going to eat oh, it. So exactly. I think combining the best of both worlds is to combine the latest in scientific research, which, you know, now that we have a movie called Forks Over Knives available on Netflix, it's a lot easier because a lot of people won't sit there and read a three or 400 page book or even listen to an audio CD. But hey, most everybody has Netflix now and you say, hey, 87 minutes, Netflix, a movie that can change your life. People will watch this wonderful movie and get their feet wet into this area. And then we can make the food taste good. It, that, that's not not a problem. That's the easiest part. The hard part is changing people's mind it about really what, is. The, the, yeah. you know, oh, where am I going to get my protein? You know, I mean, I mean, if I had a penny for every time I've heard that in the last 37 years, I could retire now. You know, these misconceptions that, oh, olive oil, isn't that healthy? You know, these things you, where are you going to get? Oh, young? we're going to get into that. Yeah. You're not going to get cows. I mean, these are myths. These are myths. And well, you know, we're it, the, and the science, well, I think part of the problem of why these myths kind of perpetuate is because the science is accelerating so fast. I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have this understanding of the, the bacteria in our guts and how important that is, you know, uh, and now they've practically mapped the genome of the, of the bacteria. Um, that, talk about some of the latest science that you've discovered that has had the biggest impact. Well I mean, just, just things like, you know, people that, that, that take statins, the, like the number, I believe they're the number two prescribed drugs, cholesterol-lowering medications after thyroid medications, have an increased risk for diabetes. I mean, everybody gets a statin now from their doctor. You know, the doctor doesn't say, oh, we'll change your diet and lifestyle. You know, they just assume you're not going to do it or that it's genetic and everybody gets these drugs. Well, they're not without risk, you know? And so the, the people don't know these. If the, somebody in a white coat tells you to do something, I question everything. I've been like that since I was little. And, and I 
question authority. I question everything. And people need to start taking control of their own health destiny by watching a movie, by reading a book, by asking questions, by looking stuff up on the internet, not just to blindly accept that they have these genetic conditions, which maybe genetics contributed. But, you know, if you read the China study, which is one of the best books you can read about this subject, genetics only loads the gun. It's your diet and lifestyle right. that pulls the trigger. And once people actually change their nutrition to a whole food plant-based diet, you can actually change the expression of your genes. And so, you know, people like the old joke is, is people say, well, doctor, you know, I can't help it that I'm fat because diabetes runs in my family. And then your doctor says, no, you're fat because nobody runs in your family, you know? <laughs> so so <laughs> the thing is, is people blame genetics on a lot of things. And, you know, you have blue eyes because the genetics, of course, genetics contributes to a very, very small percentage as to whether or not you get the disease. Whether or not these genes express is up to your diet and lifestyle, and you do right. have control over your health destiny. And most people are just victims, and they say, oh, poor me, nothing I can do. My mother was fat. My father was fat. You know, my grandmother was fat. Well, they were fat not because of the diseases that ran in the family, but because of the recipes that were handed down from generation to generation. And when you change the food, you can change your health destiny. And I've proven that because my parents and one of my brothers all died from what really are preventable diseases like mm. heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and certain cancers. And they also had autoimmune disease. And all these things can pretty much be alleviated, if not completely reversed, by a whole food plant based diet. Yeah. And, you know, it's yeah. just the way it is. And, it, I said, it, and, you know, you said I don't look 54. Well, because for 37 years, I've been eating in a manner that basically keeps me young. And my sister does the same thing. And we're, you know, we're older than a lot of people. We're not on medication. We don't really go to doctors, you know, hardly ever get sick, things like that. Yeah. It's all good. Well, we, we live in a strange time though, don't you think, where, you know, we're told constantly that we have to visit our doctor to get nutritional advice. And yet <laughs> these doctors we go to know less about nutrition than the average, than we do. The average right. housewife who watches Dr. Oz. I mean, absolutely. I'm not sure if I want to get people to get their nutritional information for Dr. Oz, but the thing is, is it's true. If you go to a doctor that doesn't know about nutrition, John Robbins says that's like calling a fireman when your house is burning down and he's never heard about water. Then neither <laughs> of them are going to be able to save you. So, so I, I think doctors are great when you have a broken bone and things like that, you know, for Emergency. trauma care, but for preventative medicine, uh uh. Yeah. Well, one of the, the biggest things I guess they don't understand, and the you gave the best explanation when you were at the Schwartz Market of the, the caloric density scale and why it's so right. important to understand it. And, uh, you know, when, when the whole book about unprocessed, I mean, we know that processed food is bad, but we don't know exactly right. why. And you really lay out that it's because you get more calories, but less nutrition. Exactly. You know, you know here's the thing. And what I want to tell people because not everybody's going to be plant-based people are going to continue eating animals that's their right but what they have to understand is you nobody has to eat processed food nobody has to be eating sugars and flours and things like that and so you, we could argue whether animal products are good i would argue that they're not especially dairy but let's say you want to eat those that's your choice but why why do you have to eat processed food that's not food and that is a, a a, at least triple caloric density of whole natural food. And like you say, when you process a food, whether it's olives into olive oil or beets into sugar or whole grain into flour, you make a food that's now calorie rich and nutrient poor. Mm -hmm. Foods that didn't exist in nature, that still don't exist in nature, that our ancestors didn't evolve eating. And these are foods that are basically causing Americans to be fat and sick. You know, two thirds of Americans now are overweight. About 35% of those are obese. The CDC says by about the year 2050, over 50% of Americans will be obese. And it's not genetics. It's the food that changed. We didn't used to eat processed food. And, you know, there's parts in the world today that still don't eat processed food. And they're trim and they're healthy. And they don't have the kind of diseases that we have at all. Yeah. But yeah I interviewed uh, Dr. Neil Bernard one time. And he said that we live Love in a strange him. time when you have both the sickest Americans and more people taking more care of themselves at the same time. So we actually have this strange kind of inverted bell yeah. curve, you know. Mm. Well, I think those that have access to the information, but you know, you also, you have to want it. I mean, I, I, right. I'm a real, I, I'm one, a lot of my work is with people that are food addicts and sometimes even with the information, some people still are not going to choose to take it or get well, just like, I mean, m most alcoholics probably know that they would be 
better if they stop drinking, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it even with access to the best treatment and best information, unfortunately. You know, it, sure. free will. You, you know, nobody has to do this, but I'll tell you, I have counseled thousands of people and coached them through their health, improving their health, and not one has ever said, you know what, I felt so much better when I was fat and on 14 medications and <laughs> injecting myself with insulin. It's never happened. I've never had one person, as hard as it might have been to make these changes, that said it wasn't worth it, you know? Well, and it is worth it because, I mean, you know, without your health, you've got nothing. Absolutely. You have nothing. Absolutely. And it is your greatest wealth. And I know people that are quite wealthy and celebrities, and they have all the money in the world, but they don't, still don't take this information and they still don't get well. So, you know, ha, ha, you know, wealth without health is meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. Health is wealth. And it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you don't exercise nope. and if you don't eat the right. right things, there's no pill. There's right. no but shot. You can't pay people to eat. For, you can't, yeah. can't pay people to eat your kale or go to the gym for you. If there was a way to pay somebody to exercise for me, I, I have no problem eating the right food. But that's always been my struggle. And I do exercise. But I'll tell you, if they ever devise a way that I could just take a pill or pay somebody. Also, wish I could find somebody to pee for me. Because sometimes <laughs> I'm so busy. And, I, and especially in the middle of the night. When I wake up, if there was a way to do that, For just doctors, a pill. If you're listening, but I want. Yeah, what? seriously, I would pay somebody to be to pee and exercise for me because these things take up too much of my day, and I got better things to do, like creating new recipes and talking to people like you. That is too much fun. I don't even know where to go from there. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the whole the whole thing with the caloric uh, yeah. density scale. What I found fascinating is, you know, every supermodel apparently knows that it takes more calories to chew uh, a stick of celery than it, the, than is in the celery but it's not just true of un, you know tasteless celery it's pretty much true of a wide range of right. things well well here's the thing that you know Foods exist on a spectrum for between 100 calories a pound, which are non-starchy vegetables, to 4,000 calories a pound, which are all processed oils. And as you go increase foods in caloric density, not only do you decrease nutrition in general because you have let you've either taken the fiber out or you have less fiber and water, but you decrease satiety, which means that the foods with the lowest caloric density, which are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, which are 100 to 600 calories a pound, mm -hmm. these are foods that fill you up because they're full of water, they're full of fiber, which creates bulk, which creates satiety. The foods of higher caloric density, with the exception of a few of the whole food plant fats, like nuts and seeds and avocado, which are very calorically dense, but most of the foods, things like cheese and fish and flour and sugar and oil and bread and ice cream that have caloric densities of 1,200 to 4,000 calories a pound, well, these things are lacking water, lacking fiber, lacking nutrients, and they don't fill you up. And so the only way to be, feel full on these foods of very high caloric density is to overeat calories, which mm. is the position that most Americans are in right. because America, 92% of their calories from animal products and processed food and less than 10% of their calories from plant foods. And if they would just flip that, I mean, I'd rather have them go 100%, but they're just not eating fruits and vegetables, basically. And that's really the key to the kingdom is to eat more fruits and vegetables, regardless of what other aspects your diet has. People just don't eat fruits and vegetables, especially yeah. vegetables, especially green ones. Yeah, yeah. So the the couple of the key numbers to to remember are seven hundred is everything under that is well at, at six hundred. So what it is is it's vegetables, non starchy vegetables are these are averages. By the way, you're always right. going to find some that are higher, some that are lower. But we just say that uh, non starchy vegetables, things like all the greens and cauliflower and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and sugar snap peas, lettuce. These things are about one hundred calories a pound. Mm -hmm. You cannot overeat on vegetables. You can just there's, eat those as no much way. as you want all day long, and you'll oh, never gain all day long because you know you. I mean I. I eat almost four pounds of vegetables a day and most people can't even eat one so yeah. 400 calories but you're eating a lot of food you're getting bulk you're chewing a lot so you know there's a sign on my fridge that says nobody ever got fat from eating too much kale because you just can't get fat eating fruits and vegetables and fruits are about 300 calories a pound now some fruits like zucchini bell pepper cucumber and tomato which are actually like salad vegetables to most people these are actually about 73 calories a pound mm. so you really can eat all the fruits and vegetables you want and and not only not gain weight but lose weight and be slim. And then what we have next is the unrefined complex carbohydrates, which at 400 calories a pound are the potatoes and the squashes, 500 the whole grains, and 600 the legumes. 
lentils, split peas, beans. Now, there's a researcher at Penn State named Dr. Barbara Rolls who's written three books on this subject. It's called Volumetrics, if people want to know more specifically about this. But what she determined is that if you eat at a caloric density of about 600 calories per pound or less, you just can't gain weight and you will lose weight. And the thing is, is you will be eating more food. You know, I used to weigh over 60 pounds more than I weigh now. I weigh about 117. I used to weigh 180. Mm. But now I actually, and this was as a vegan, eating the wrong vegan sure. foods, eating sugars and oils and flours and processed food. But the truth is, is like Dean Ornish said in 1980, you really can't eat more and weigh less. And I lost all this weight eating more and not even exercising at all. Not that you shouldn't exercise because I changed the caloric density of my food. And for weight loss, calorie dilution is the solution. So starting as many meals as possible with a salad, not with an oily dressing or a rope for cheesy dressing, but or with some steamed vegetables or with a broth-based soup or eating some fruit. You fill up on the lower caloric density foods first. And by the way, especially fruits and vegetables, these things can be 85 to 95% water. Sure. And so they're very, very calorie dilute, but they also are very high in nutrients. And Americans are not getting enough nutrients for their diet. They're nutrient deficient from eating animal products and processed food, which don't have fiber and water and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants. This is what's found in the plant food. And if they're only eating 7% of their calories from this, of course they're nutrient deficient. And when they're nutrient deficient, they're always going to be driven to overeating calories. But instead of eating the fruits and vegetables, they keep eating more and more. You know, I've, I've, I've consulted with over 2,000 people now, and I keep pretty good data on them. And one of the things when they come to me as a private client is I do an intake form asking them what they eat. And one of the questions is, how many servings of fruits and vegetables do you eat every day? And there is a direct correlation between a person's weight and how much produce they eat. And it's inversely proportional. The less produce they eat, the heavier they are. And they've done studies on this. The leaner people eat more vegetables. People just aren't eating fruits and vegetables. And that's really the take-home message. And what I try to do as my job as a chef is make this way of eating easy, delicious, and fun. And not just do all the processed food and all the fake meats and things, which can be transitional foods and important for people. But people have got to eat, if they don't have to, but if they want health, they have to start eating fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables. And in my program, the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we recommend that they eat vegetables for breakfast. And I do. I don't ever start a day without a pound of vegetables. Huh. And as weird as people think that is, now that I've been traveling across the globe, every country that I've ever visited, except for the United States, serves people vegetables as part of their breakfast. It's only here that breakfast is... Well, when I was in Mexico, and I go there quite a bit to teach, I get beans and corn tortillas and steamed vegetables. I think it was cauliflower, broccoli, and carrots. Hmm. When I was in Japan, I was given salad for breakfast along with miso soup and rice. It's only in the United States that it's Captain Crunch with crunch berries and caramel fakeados and all kinds of sugary process crap. And people don't eat like this in the rest of the world. Yeah. Well, they kind of are starting to now and they're getting, you know, the thing is, is you, if other countries are trying to eat like other Americans and they're getting fat and sick like us. But when you go to parts of Japan and China and Ethiopia and Mexico, when you're not in the big cities, you find the lean trim people. Sometimes they're the poor people, but that is the best way to eat. The beans, the rice, sure. the corn. This is how people have lived for years uh, throughout millennia, eating whole natural unprocessed food. Sure. It's very new, this whole process. You know, there's a couple of books I'd like to recommend to sure. your listeners. Um, this is where I learned much of this. Is uh, One is called The End of Overeating by Dr. David Kessler. He's the former head of the FDA. And the other book by a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Michael Moss, is called Salt, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. Both of these books explain why processed food is addictive, the sugar's addictive, the fat's addictive, the salt's addictive, and how the processed food industry knew they were purposely creating an addictive product. And so when I read Dr. Kessler's book, I immediately stopped eating all processed food, even vegan processed food, because I didn't like my brain chemistry being hijacked for somebody else's profit. And, you know, once you start eating processed food, your health will improve. And the, I, I want to get to a couple more things on this before we leave the idea of the, the caloric mm -hmm. density. And, and that is sure. that there's a few things over that red line of six to 700 yeah. that are really yeah. still kind of good for you, but you have to watch right. how much. Oh, like sure. Nuts. Yeah, no, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so, avocados. Yeah, sure. Now, here's the thing. I, one of my focuses, I work with a lot of people that need and want to lose weight. And so I don't say that nuts and seeds and tahini and avocado are bad. They are not. They're very helpful. And I'd much rather see people eating those whole unprocessed food, preferably salt-free, than oil. But if somebody is okay. trying to lose weight, peanut butter, which is 3,000 calories a pound, while it may be helpful, isn't really going to help them facilitate weight loss. Yeah. I'd rather see them eat avocado at 750 calories a pound because you get more bang for your caloric body. 
o'clock. And, you know, an avocado is about 200 calories, but that's the same amount of calories in a quarter cup of walnuts. I look at food as what's going to fill me up more. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, I could eat seven for 500 calories. I could eat about seven apples or I could eat one cup of dried apple rings. Now, they still have similar nutrition. The only thing that's really been removed from the dried apple rings is the water. But what's going to fill me up? You know, in our stomach, we have stretch receptors, nutrient receptors, and calorie receptors. And so the thing about these high-fat whole plant foods is, yes, they're healthy. They're great, like, like little garnishes and condiments. But if you're just going to eat nuts, you're going to have to eat a lot of them to feel full. So maybe make a salad dressing with the nuts or maybe sprinkle a few on your salad. But, you know, our ancestors, every nut they had to crack by hand. You're right. They, and nuts were seasonal. Now you can go to Costco and buy three pounds already shelled and roasted and salted. So it, things are a little bit different now. So I don't tell people not to eat nuts, seeds, tahini, and avocado, but I say to be mindful if your goal is weight loss because they are more calorically dense than eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains. But yet they're still quite healthy and they're still going to be way better for you than eating the processed oils and flours and sugars. Now, I know these, this, the answer to this is in some of the books you just mentioned, but give us your mm -hmm. quickest answer to this question is why, when you said this it, at the Schwartz market, it blew my mind. You said that olive oil is actually worse for you uh, as far as your, your, your arteries and your veins mm -hmm. than red meat or dairy. Well, I don't know if it's worse. It's, I don't think it's necessarily worse. It's just pretty bad. If I said worse, I apologize, but it's really, well, really bad. I think you said yeah. that, that the reactions of the... the, the well. well Go ahead and tell us. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, you know, I think I think the worst product, I think the worst thing out there is dairy. That's what I would tell people to give up first and foremost, okay. and even before other animal products. But the thing about oil, and again, if your listeners will just please go to Netflix or buy the movie Forks Over Knives, this is explained really well, very quickly in a wonderful computer graphic. It's also in the book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Dr. Esselstyn, and you can actually go to YouTube, put in Dr. Esselstyn, and watch his whole lecture at the Cleveland Clinic where he talks mm -hmm. about this. But oil in is what's called the endothelial cells, which is the life jacket of the circulatory system. And, and you know, if you already have heart disease, this isn't so good because it creates a sludge, it decreases blood flow. You don't want that. Also, just let's just pretend it's healthy. It's not. It's 4,000 calories a pound. We already mentioned that two-thirds of Americans are overweight or obese. Why do we want to give them the most calorically dense food that has no fiber, which means it's not going to create any satiety. It has no nutrients. You know, when, when you say to people, what's the defini definition of a junk food? Most people think of sugar because it's a food that has calories and no nutrients. Well, so does oil. I mean, sure, there's trace amounts of vitamin E, but it is just, we have really been sold a bill of goods with both dairy and olive oil. Yeah. It takes about 44 olives to make one tablespoon of olive oil. Most people, if they're eating olives, don't eat 44 olives. Yeah. It takes 16 ears of corn to make one tablespoon of corn oil. Most people I know can't eat 16 ears of corn because when you process the corn into the corn oil or the olives into the olive oil, all the good stuff in the whole plant food, the fiber and the water and the vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants are thrown out in the processing that becomes the sludge and you're drinking or eating the non-nutritive portion. Mm. And the thing is, is... The, the more, okay, we didn't talk about this yet, but the neurotransmitter that's released in the brain when we have a pleasurable experience called dopamine. Well, that's that's the my next question, actually. We're going right. to Right. Well, that. the more yeah. concentrated the source of calories, the more dopamine is released. That's why people love high fat foods like these nut butters ah. and dopamine. Uh, like, like, excuse me, like they like the high fat foods like the nut butters and the oils at 4,000 calories a pound. They're getting more dopamine in their brain. They're not exercising, which is a way to get dopamine naturally. Some are born with lower levels of dopamine. And so if you think about olive oil, it doesn't really taste that good. I don't know if you've ever tried to drink it by itself, but it's kind of nasty. It actually can almost make you vomit. Yeah. It's a carrier for salt and other things, but it's really, I mean, and you know, I consult with many restaurants out here to get the oil out of the food. And at first, because Chefs are not taught in culinary school how not to cook with oil. Right. And at first, the chefs are kind of like got their arms crossed and they look at me like, oh, you know. But once they learn how easy it is and how much better the food tastes, because oil actually coats the taste buds on your tongue, kind of like you're wearing a condom and you can't taste the food. But I've worked with some restaurants, some that I can name, some that I can't. And once the chefs get a hang of it, they are thrilled because, first of all, they can be creative now and foods can really taste better, but also they're saving so much money mm. not using oil. So it's really a triumph of marketing over science, this whole oil thing. And, you know, people always say, well, what about the Mediterranean Heart Study? Well, the thing about that Mediterranean Heart Study, 
what it showed is that when people switch from butter, which which is worse and higher in cholesterol than olive oil, olive oil is not doesn't have cholesterol, does have saturated fat though, people's cholesterol went down. But if you take somebody like me that, that doesn't eat oil and start giving me oil, my cholesterol will go up. So again, just because something is less bad doesn't mean, mean it's good. And yes, olive oil is less bad than butter and pork probably, but it's not a health supporting food. It's not a weight loss food. And you don't need it. You know, like I said, I was a pastry chef for four years. I cook without it. You can go to Dr. McDougall's website, get 2,000 recipes for free without oil, happy herbivore, fat-free vegan. There's all these people that know how to cook without it. It's super easy. Of oil, sugar, and salt, it's probably the easiest thing to not use. I, I'd have to agree with that. I'd have to agree with that. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we only have a few minutes left here. Let's talk about like how to stay motivated. You mentioned dopamine. Uh, you get it from the high fat foods, but you also get it from... Get it from sex. So well, that's, that's just everyone turn to a partner right now. Thank you. But, you know, you can get it from sex. And, you know, the thing is, is the... Pro the processed food industry has has hijacked our brain chemistry, and so they've learned to artificially stimulate dopamine in the brain. If we, you know, if if we locked everybody up in a, a prison in Cuba, um, everybody would get thin. You'd be eating beans and rice, and you know, you'd learn to be adapt, neuroadapt to the level of dopamine from that amount of food because all eating stimulates dopamine in the brain, but it's these higher caloric foods that stimulate it more. Right. So of course, there's going to be a period of people maybe not feeling as good from these foods. They'll say they don't taste as good but I really believe it's not so much taste. It's just that they're not getting as much dopamine in the brain. So hmm. why, what you do is you go to a, if, if you can't do this at home, you go to a place like the McDougal program in Santa Rosa or True North where neuroadaptation can occur easily because you're in a controlled environment of rest. You're not having to do your job. But you know, in the meantime, Everyone, regardless of their level of health or commitment, can eat more vegetables. Everybody can do that. You know, I always talk to people. I'm like, do you brush your teeth? And people are like, yeah. And I'm like, why? And they don't know why. You know, usually you know, people say, well, because my parents made me. And I'm like, well, you're an adult now. Do you still brush your teeth? And they go, yeah. And I go, why? Well, you know, because it's a habit. Well, you know, vegetables can become a habit too. And the more you eat them, the more you like them. And the reason I tell people to eat them for breakfast and eat them first is because obviously with caloric density of only 100, if you eat peanut butter, 3,000 calories, those 100 calorie a pound vegetables aren't going to taste good. But if you're super hungry, like I am in the morning after my spin class, roasted Brussels sprouts taste amazing. Mm. So everybody can do a little bit better than they're doing now. Start eating more vegetables. And, and then you get used to them. You actually can like them. You know, they can become like some of your favorite foods too, especially if you're not eating so much of the crap foods. Right, right. It's Absolutely. a process. Going on process is a process. It, you it's know? a process, it, yeah. <laughs> it took me over 50 years to figure this out. So, you know, I don't expect people to get it overnight, but there's no danger in eating more vegetables for any of us. That is, that's a classic. It's a process going unprocessed. It is. It really is. It's um, a, li in a lifelong process for many people. Yeah. I really want to thank you. You're you're such a bundle of information, and you well, got you. so much more out than I thought we were going to get covered here in this time. Well, cool. I know we, we both got to run here. We got a thunderstorm booming over our head right this second. Wow. So we, we might go out at any minute, but oh my gosh! I know it's always exciting here in in, Pete, in Pittsburgh. What's uh, what would you say would be the one most important thing that we didn't cover yet? Is there anything that really you think is? Well, I don't think we covered. I don't think we really covered how detrimental dairy was. So if you want okay. to have me back, we can talk about that, or maybe better yet, have the master, have Dr. Colin Campbell. I bet sure. he would do an interview with you. But I think people have also been sold a bill of goods with dairy, a triumph of marketing over science. It really is not a health food; it's a hurt food, and it's probably the worst food out there. Because think about it, dairy at uh, 1,600 calories a pound for cheese and 1,200 for ice cream. Dairy is both an animal product and a processed food. So it's the worst mm. of both worlds. And I think people really, and, and it's more addictive actually. It, it, you know, We didn't talk about how addictive dairy was to the brain chemistry through casomorphines and how addictive sugar was. That I could talk, we could talk a whole class about yeah. sugar. Oh, yeah. that, that's bad news. Sugar is yeah. bad news. Well, we've known that since William Duffy wrote Sugar Blues in the oh, 70s. Oh, yeah, in know. the 50s. I yeah. think in the, it was a great, and that is, is as true today as it was then. But now we have that documentary that came out a few months ago called Fed Up. They've been, they have, they have proven that sugar is more addictive to your brain than heroin or than cocaine. Heroin. So, yeah. you know, and people, people tell their kids to say no to drugs, but yet they're two years old and they're feeding them Coke in a sippy cup at Costco. So it's, it's a mm. crazy world we live in, isn't yeah. it? Well, it's people like you that put out the good information that we want to help promote and uh, really, really pleased and happy to have you on our show today. Thanks. And just remember, if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're not hungry. <laughs> Thank you, Chef AJ. 
Thank you, it's been Sven. It's a real pleasure. Say hi to everybody in Pittsburgh. Hello, sister in law. Hello, <laughs> nephews. <laughs> all your all your friends and all the folks. All on my Schwartz friends market. and family in, yep. in the hood. That's great. Well, thanks again, and that is going to do it for this week. Oh, my goodness, how much fun was that? Uh, join us again next week for the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine here on our podcast. Look for us on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and YouTube. And we're live every Tuesday at 4 o'clock right here on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine.com. Be sure to look up our meetup group, our Integrative Medicine Professionals Meetup. If you're a professional and you want to meet us on Saturday at the Pittsburgh Public Market, go back and watch our calendar. You'll see about that. So until next time, yens be careful out there. Thank you.